All right, so this is an interview with Cody Bramlett about his psychology. So before we go any further, why don't you just tell everyone what your business is and if you don't mind the uh, revenue per year? Definitely. Um, so like, like Sean said, my name is Cody Bramlett. I'm the owner of a company called Science Natural Supplements. That's become another company called Waddle Bear Media, which just houses that and all my brands. Um, I then have a coaching business where I teach people to what I teach people to do what I do, um, and that's called Supplement Millionaire. And we're in the direct marketing um, affiliate space. So we we basically create products, supplements, health related items, and we sell them through long ten thousand word stories, whether it be video or a text page, explaining the benefits, the pros, the cons, the science behind what they're actually getting, and teaching people in massive detail, and also through some creative, fun stories that get them to know, like, and trust us and make a purchase the first time. It's very different from a lot of um, e-commerce people who may take seven, eight, nine touches on somebody. We can get about a two to four percent conversion rate on the first touch with people, which is quite cool. Um, so that's what we do. Our revenue has bounced from uh, two and a half million to highest to 18. And we've consistently been in that uh, eight figure range since 2020. Um, and the business has grown and grown and grown. All right, great. Thank you. I appreciate the intro. So I'm curious, what made you want to be an entrepreneur? Yeah, oh my gosh. My parents asked this question to me recently. My brother's the same as me. He has a, a, another digital business online. And they're like, I don't know what it is. We didn't tell you to do it. But they always, when we were kids, said, you can be anything. You can do anything. And I think they were just being stereotypical, positive you know, Americans. And they weren't realizing that they really, truly were instilling that ability for us to build and, and develop and, and grow, um, something that could be kind of big. I've always been a leader. I remember back in uh, seventh, gr eighth grade, I think. And I remember being the, uh, you know, you do this group school projects and I decided I didn't want to do anything. So I picked the smartest kids in the class who were the least popular and um, they all did their parts. And I just compiled it all together because my dad had the fancy print uh, computer with the color printer. And I spent like one day's worth of work and we had got an A plus and I didn't even know what the project was about, right? So I, I'm pretty, I've been pretty good at trying to, amalgamate others work and, and their strengths to mind of being able to complete something, create that vision of something that has continuity and, and put it together. Uh, you know, the, the guy that loves selling magazines and chocolate, I won those contests and I, I was driven by that concept. Uh, it probably comes back to the fact that my parents were, you know, we were not well off. We were not, um, you know, very rich people by any means. And uh, my parents saved and saved and saved. We shopped at Kmart. I got a pair of jeans, a couple pairs of jeans once a year. You know, if I got a pair of shoes at the beginning of the year and they got destroyed, we glued them and duct taped them together. You know, it was kind of family lifestyle we had. So it just is what it is. And that kind of, I think, drove me to want to build something where I wasn't reliant on others for a paycheck, where I could depend on myself because I have more confidence in me than I do in someone else. Um, seeing my actual potential. So it's interesting you you mentioned the uh, financial side of your family growing up. I interviewed another guy recently, his name is Glenn Bimani. And he said that he realized when he was young that his family was like in poverty. And so our conversation was about how growing up poor has the potential to drive entrepreneurship. Um, for whatever reason, I guess, dependent on the individual. So it's really cool that uh, I mean, it, it's not cool that you grew up poor, but it's it's cool that um, you have a similar kind of a story. Yeah. And I wouldn't say I was necessarily poor. It's just my parents were not spending constantly. You know, they, they were incredible savers, right? They are mm. taken care of forever with their retirement. You know, they, they, okay. we grew up in the middle of California. So housing and life was just, you know, 10 times more expensive than it is everywhere else. But it's just there was, um, you know, all, all my friends would have fancy stuff and I just wouldn't. Right. Mm. I, remember, I remember a handful of friends in, in our, our church group who just always had nice stuff and their parents always had new cars and all these other things like that. And my parents just, you know, the car's good enough. Right. Why do you need a new one? And it's kind of funny, you know, I, at, at first I was chasing money because I wanted the shiny stuff. I wanted the fancy things. But then I realized in life those things are kind of worthless and pointless. And, you know, it's a car. Who cares? It's good enough. I drive a Chevy. Uh, I don't know what's called the, the electric one, the Volt or Bolt. Mm. Right. It's a it's a twenty thousand dollar car. Like who cares? Like it's just a thing. Um, so th th yeah, th th the money thing was interesting growing up. I just I definitely I think drove me to find and want more. But I don't mm. think it was the end all be all. I think it has to do I think more with control and confidence in myself. Mm. 
So then what made you excited for doing this business? Uh, so health. So I told my parents, it's your genetics. That's why you're overweight. You can't change it. What do we know? You want to talk about for dinner? <laughs> so like that was uh, also not bringing. My parents were not aware of that. And if you think back in the you know 80s and early 90s, there was just a low fat craze. That was the idea of health in, in the world. Jazzercise, right? We didn't understand exercise, nutrition, the way we do. You know, I, I love the episode of South Park when they flip the pyramid and they talk about how steak and butter's the key and it's this whole crazy, you know, gluten. Oh, it's just hilarious video episode. Um, but they didn't know, and they they really couldn't have known without being a health professional. And I uh, really wanted to become healthier, change my life. And so I seeked education in that. I seek knowledge in it. I found exercise and fell in love with that. I started um, uh, I, I, learning how to become, a, a, after college, I found a kettlebell gym. I became a, a certified instructor there, did that after work every day, and uh, eventually opened my own kettlebell gym in San Diego. And from there, I was just learning more about health, nutrition, and exercise. And I actually had um, people coming into my gym and be like, hey, tell me about the supplements I have. Which one should I take? Are these any good? And I look at the supplements they have and they'd be buying them from, you know, Herbalife and these big multi-level marketing companies. And, uh, the products were absolute crap. They had very limited, uh, uh, you know, what they need. The protein powder had like eight grams of protein per serving. I'm like, this is worthless. Um, and they just were not, they were overpaying for junk. And that led me to realize that I don't actually want to have a gym. I don't want to try and just work hard to, to please 200 clients to, you know, work 40 hours a week, teaching classes and exhausting myself. I wanted to reach more on, on a bigger audience. I love the Walmart approach, right? Being able just to hit as many people as humanly possible. Um, you can't do that with brick and mortars without a, tons of financing. And so the online world became the next key. And um, around that time, my brother and I were in Mexico and he's like, oh, I think Termix gonna be the next big thing. And I looked into it and did research. And from there, created my company. And, and that was our first major product. And we probably did three, half, four million the first year of just turmeric sales. Um, the manufacturer, he joked with me, he's like, oh, you, you, I've never had someone sell more than I had in, in, in stock. And I blew through his stuff in like three months. And he was like, oh, you know, I just caught him off guard. So um, it, 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 that idea of health, not having a lot kind of led me down the path through multiple steps to eventually realize what I wanted was to be able to influence and help the masses on a more basic nutritional level than versus where I started out in this very niche training of exercise and, and, and diet modalities. So did you source your turmeric from Mexico? And I, I understand turmeric, I eat turmeric, but maybe you just want to very briefly explain why you felt like turmeric was a good thing to, to go with and like, what's the benefit of it? Yeah. So the idea of anti-inflammatories in terms of food was brand new. It had not been thought of, it had not been brought to the masses yet. And a, a lot of health crazes are, are very much recycled, but the idea of reducing inflammation hadn't really been, I, I can't think of something that's really been brought up before. And so my brother mentioned that and I was just like, oh, interesting. And so I went home and started researching it. Um, and in, in the supplement world, unless you're crazy, and I have a few crazy friends who've done this, you don't manufacture yourself. You know, that'd be that'd be like being like, hey, I want to sell, I don't know, like keyboards, right? You don't go to figure out how to build your own keyboard. You sell keyboards online. And then eventually when you understand the market better, you can start to manufacture your own in-house brand or get a white labeled version and then make a custom one and kind of, you know, get better at the business. So I found a manufacturer in Atlanta. I have no clue what the product was. It wasn't even turmeric. It was raw curcumin, which is distilled turmeric. And it was like so intense, little old ladies were having like stomach problems because it was like too intense of a product. So I ended up switching to a different manufacturer and using their white labeled turmeric, which was a, a mix of turmeric root, curcumin and biocream. And it was the perfect blend that I've been looking for for a long time. And they did an on a, a quasi on demand thing where they would keep a infant, I would, basically prepay inventory for me. So that way I always had a supply going and that eventually evolved in their business and other ones to be an on-demand style. And I particularly don't have any inventory in any of my businesses. We do everything with an on-demand supply um, in the, in terms of the products themselves. Um, it could come from Mexico, could come from Hawaii, could come from, from China, from India. Um, the supplement markets are very um, like buying grain, right? You know, there was on the on international markets, very, uh, uh, could be from anywhere. And so a lot of these products are bought from these large um, traders. And uh, there's a few, few huge um, tr uh, supplement ingredient traders that are from India and China, and who knows where they could have sourced it from. Everything is though checked scientifically to make sure it's clear of metals and leads and all that junk like that. But 
you know, at our scale, we can't go to a particular farm in a particular forest in Hawaii and say, can you be our supplier? Because we could blow through his entire crop very fast and not have, it, not have supply afterwards. You were talking about on-demand supply, and I'm curious about it. I've heard that a lot of companies like pride themselves on, you know, just in time manufacturing and things like that. Globalization and the pandemic kind of may have blown a hole in that. I could be wrong, but did did the pandemic affect that for you or did you I guess why did you choose that method and does it still work and why? So it comes down to the actual supplier you're using. So there's three in, in the industry that I work closely with, and these companies all keep massive amounts of ingredients for their main products. You know, we have conversations about how, how many products we'll be using and needing in the next 90 days, and they keep and make sure that everything's taken care of. But among them, you know, I, I probably do 50 to 80,000 units of product between all my lines uh, in a month, but there's people who easily do 200 um, to 500,000 units a month. So I'm not even the biggest people out there in the direct marketing world. The idea of on demand is it protects you from running out of inventory and running out of capital to fund that inventory. Because it, beforehand, you had to buy product. So say you needed a $50,000 purchase order to get your inventory for the next 60 days. You would have to put down $25,000 cash now. And then when they finish it, the remaining $25,000 and then wait seven to 10 days for it to arrive to your fulfillment house to then start shipping. And all the people I work with now, they do the manufacturing, the storage of inventory, and the fulfillment all from one location. So they're able to keep a much better eye on the product and keep it going. I have custom products that we do on demand with, and we have white labels like that turmeric and omega-3 and things that are more generic that don't need to be special. They just need to be great. Um, and uh, those ones that you know, 10, 20, 30 other vendors will sell the same product I have. Just kind of like Amazon. You go on there and type in turmeric. I guarantee you about a third of what's on there comes from one manufacturer. So what was the hardest thing about starting this business? In the direct marketing world, it's all about that story to get it to convert. So we're, we don't teach how to buy ads. It's not something I've really been uh, greatly successful at in any large scale. It's about telling a story so a customer knows, likes, and trusts you. So the original story was about my dad. His doctor actually said, go eat turmeric because it's an anti-inflammatory. He had some health problems and they're just like, you should do that. So I worked with a, a copywriter with my dad's story and my story, and we wrote an embellished story about my dad. And um, that story, you know, helped sell the story of what turmeric is to teach people what it is and how it can help. And so in the direct marketing world, people do this for supplements, they do this for finance, they do this for beauty, they do this for clothing, they do this for anything you can imagine. I've seen pillows before, right? Um, and the idea is you're telling a story of someone's struggle and what they did to overcome it and how they, they discovered that information. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with experts to help us make the formulations and then use part of their stories in, 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 in the, uh, the copy, but creating that story has been the most complicated piece. My second sales page was really basic. And I've had friends in the, in the industry tell me, oh, I saw that and I thought it was nothing, not realizing I was doing like $6 million a year on that page. Um, and uh, it just hit a note. And so once you have that page that works well with traffic, the next step is to find the traffic. And a lot of people today are like, oh, I'm going to just, it's all going to be me, right? I'm going to go to Facebook and put the ads up and go. But letting all your, putting all your eggs in one basket is dangerous because Facebook can shut you down. They've shut down my accounts before where I can't run ads under my name anymore. You got to have uh, my staff members do it. Um, and uh, so we prefer to use what's called affiliate marketing. And the affiliates, there's 400, 500 affiliates with these giant email lists. And they've sold products to collect their email lists and, and build their customer list. And they promote other people's products. So you make friends with them. You say, hey, I'll promote you if you promote me. Hey, I'm going to pay you a large commission if you ever grab your sale you get. And then we just starts going. And we've had, you know, uh, multi, multi-million dollar months before just from emails going out saying, hey, do you like turmeric? Check out this great deal. Hey, do you like moringa? Check out this. Hey, are you interested in an apple cider vinegar gummy? That's awesome. Check out this. And it's crazy what um, influence a lot of these people with their email list have over their audience. Um, and it's amazing to see what growth comes from it. You can go from an offer doing zero dollars to doing half a million to a million dollars in 30 days. So I like that you brought that up. I do want to leave it there 
because our other interview will be about affiliates. Yes. We can go so, a lot more detail about that. <laughs> yes. And I would love to, especially because you're operating with them at that level. It's very interesting um, because I have talked to other e-commerce brand owners and uh, they've had their own ad issues. They've had the affiliate issues and all that, but, but yeah, I don't want to go deeper into that here. So have you ever regretted starting this company? Ah, uh, regret. Yeah, there is. So there's regrets <laughs> in how I went about it. You know, it, it, in the, um, the direct marketing world, people tend to be like, it's all me. So I start, I, you know, quit my job. I had my gym. I sold my gym to a friend for whatever I can get to get out of it, right? And get out of the lease, really. And um, I was like, I'm, st I'm making this business on my own. And I was literally me with a dev person who was a, an agency and he had like eight clients. And I was doing everything to the point of I was, you know, the goal of starting a business is to work less, make more money, have freedom to do when what whenever you want. And then all of a sudden, I was working 24 hours a day, not sleeping, stressing my mind, panicking, because I don't know everything. So I regret not building a team and hiring a fractional CFO, uh, operations manager or COO, and a salesperson within the first year, I regret not doing that, I should have, um, I ran for three years alone which was incredibly exhausting and tiring. Um, I regret not hiring a coach sooner. In 2020, I was going through massive stress with a financial issue in the business that was not fun. And I was looking online for like a therapist until I realized that all I needed was a business coach. And when I found one, it was like life and just turning the lights on and suddenly seeing everything because I had someone who's like, don't do that. And I'm like, what? And they're like, don't do this instead. And I'm like, okay. And then everything just worked. So I regret not having that sooner. Um, I think the Another regret too would probably be that the direct marketing world to some people's eyes can seem very scammy. And where my business is at now in terms of trying to position more towards the e-commerce hybrid kind of concept where we're selling things more on the quality of the product and less on that story, I wish I would have made that transition sooner. You know, I started that transition in late 2018, um, but it would have felt, I would have felt more confidence about it. You know, I own a supplement brand versus saying, hey, I own a 10,000 word sales page that, you know, people become so invested, they at the end just purchase. So in your regrets, you said something about being extremely stressed and having a financial issue. And I think we touched on that before we started this. Am I right? Is it that story? It is. Yes. Okay, good. So, uh, can you tell me about this story? I was originally going to say, what's your most expensive mistake? But basically, you've already kind of pinpointed it. Um, why don't you go into the detail of what that is? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. So biggest mistake, $850,000 mistake. Now, uh, a lot of this did happen to iron itself out over the next year. Um, and I do have other mistakes we can always talk about later. But in the massive growth of the business during the, pan during lock the beginning of lockdown, Basically, everyone wanted to buy supplements because they were wanting to be healthier or afraid or whatever it was. Our sales went through the roof, you know, from having a good month of a million dollars to suddenly averaging 1.5 to 2 million. Um, we had a particular issue, kind of two issues. The first was we didn't have enough protection on our credit card processor to keep um, scammers out. So if you use Stripe, which you can't really use in the supplement space, especially at scale, or PayPal, they will close your accounts. If you are right now, look for alternatives, please. Um, but our credit card processor had one of like four different um, protective tools on there. And it was the weakest, least expensive on my half version. And as we scaled, I didn't remember that, didn't remember to tell them to turn the other ones on and pay the extra few grand a month to cover it. And we had about $300,000 of basically stolen credit cards with fake purchases on our products. And people were stealing the products, shipping them to this couple warehouses in New York, and then selling it on Amazon and eBay at a discount. And this is at a moment when our ads were just going crazy on Facebook. We were all over the place. Again, we did like $18 million. And that was within a sort of six month span because the business just rocket shit had shipped up. Um, and we had that first issue. So we had the issue of that happening. And then our chargebacks and refunds just suddenly exploding because it was fraudulent. And our system wasn't able to catch the fraudulent transactions. By the way, if you are doing your own business and you're not using Stripe or PayPal, you need to install Count, 3D Secure, 
uh, verify and uh, RDR. Those are the four things that you should have on your on your system because they'll help you protect your credit card processing and protect your, your customers. Um, and so that happened. And then what immediately preceded that, because we had too many chargebacks and refunds, is our credit card processors all closed, shut down, and held all the money that was in the account. So we had about $850,000 held. Now, luckily, we had another credit card processor that that I was had really good relationship with, but we weren't using that much. That he let us just keep going. And he understood the circumstance, so it was fine, and we kept that relationship alive. It's been wonderful. But basically, I lost three hundred grand in refunds and chargebacks, and then I had eight hundred fifty thousand dollars frozen that I could not touch. And it took about a year for the money to start getting released, and it wasn't until end of last year before it finally all trickled back in what was remaining um, to us. So you know. $800 million, some odd mistake. It was painful. I had to get a short-term $400,000 loan to keep the business alive, which was not cheap and complicated to get. And it was incredibly scary. So, you know, being prepared is key. And I've learned a lot from that mistake. And anybody I coach, I tell them, do not run your own credit card processing, at least for three to four years of your business. You know, use systems like Stripe, ClickBank, Buy Goods, <laughs> PayPal, if you can, because they'll protect you from these massive disasters of things just imploding. So you said that you found a business coach during this time. What was it that they taught you? Well, at first it seemed like a therapy session, right? I just basically freaked out and told them everything that was going wrong and how I don't sleep at night. And a lot of it is right. when you were an entrepreneur at first, you don't realize that you have the choice of being an entrepreneur, which is kind of a chasing shiny object person forever or becoming a CEO. And I was afraid to take that step to become a CEO. It was like, I'm not good enough. You know, I don't have the right mindset. I don't have the education or training. I'm not there. I don't deserve this. How could this be real? Very much the uh, imposter syndrome playing over and over every night kind of thing. Um, and uh, that is the first thing that was kind of reinforced and broken out of me was the ability that you are doing something great. You have something that works. You just have to fix it. You have to fix what's working. And it came down, um, you know, a lot of what he was teaching me was just, you know, SOPs, making sure people are in the right position in the company, understanding the company and having expectations of the company. And I think one of the most important things is realizing that you are not the company. You're just an employee of it, right? If, you, if your true goal is to be, you know, successful, it's that I want to just walk away, replace myself and get paid because I own the company, right? Like a board member. Like a, a heavy investor owns a massive amount of, of, of the stock of the business. You don't want to have to be in the day in, day out. You want to show up for the quarterly meeting and be like, cool. And then have the CFO be like, here's your check. And you're like, sweet. And you go back to doing what you want to do. Like that, that's the dream, right? Um, right. So, so uh, you know, that, that, uh, that idea was all kind of instilled with me. So that way I could focus on making the business right, focus on the team, focus on the systems and, and creating the, the business that builds you know, machines that print money. <laughs> what would it take for you to walk away to hire someone to replace you? Oh, um, great question. And I can't wait for the, the day when we're financially able to do so. I, I want to make sure I can empower my team and incentivize them greatly for taking that control. Uh, for me, you know, it's, it's I'm not, I don't need a lot, right? I've learned that a Lamborghini is fun to rent for it for a uh, an hour on a racetrack in Las Vegas, but to own one would be dumb. <laughs> Everyone I know that's owned supercars never drives them because it's scary, unless of course they're a car lunatic and they don't care about destroying those things. I, I think for me, it's you know having you know three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand dollars a year as passive income would be kind of that massive dream. You know that twenty, thirty thousand dollar a month check because that just at that point you can fly first class, you can have a nice house, potentially a vacation home, car or two, and free cash to do whatever you want every every month and why do you need more? It's absolutely insane to think you need more cash than that to survive. Unless you had 12 kids or something. <laughs> so if your business already does over 10 figures a year, surely you already are able to take three, $400,000 a year. So then what's stopping you from walking away if your dream is to have that? Correct. Uh, in my opinion, it should be more of from my financials, um, my personal financials. Because if you're walking away and taking three or four thousand dollars, who's paying the CEO? Who's getting the bonus for running the company? Right? I'm an employee of the company, and that is my salary, which is mm -hmm. about that amount. Um, it's I'm not I'm not going to take that away from the next person. So that so I have to be able to, to put together a savings account that can then in you know 
feed me out that kind of cash and be able to subsidize the majority of it so the business can take care of the rest. Plus, maybe the business may not last forever, right? So we got to make sure we cover all these bases. As well, I think right now in my career, I'm excited to continue to grow. I saw a quote a few days ago. It was, uh, in a gold rush, to make money in a gold rush, you don't dig for gold, you sell the shovels. And, and that, idea, that idea of creating that, how can I help someone else make this business or how can I help a consumer in all these different ways is the thought process that's still excited to me and still going through my mind. So I'm still trying to come up with ways to help people. You know, I said earlier, I have a coaching business to help people create this, right? I also have a, um, a design and dev company to help do that. I'm building a data company based on our company. So that way you, when you do all your stuff, you can have a dashboard that actually gives you information in a way that makes sense both for a financial person and for a company to operate and make it easy to set up and run. Um, I'm, I'm building lots of different things because I want to be able to diversify the streams of income for the business, but also empower more people to have more success. I have something I want to mention to you about e-commerce. I'll do it off air. Um, so it sounds like you're still excited about your business, so you don't really want to walk away from it yet is what it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I would say I'm in a transition phase where I'm learning to finally be that CEO, the visionary of the company and not micromanage and having learning to not reply to emails where I'm CC'd on them. <laughs> And I do not need to, I just need to look, look, observe, keep going. Um, learning how to run the quarterly meetings for the company, learning how to pick the right people and learning number biggest thing of all, how to make sure the business has the finances, finances it needs to grow at the scale we want so we can meet our budgets and our targets and our, and our company expectations. So I'm, I'm still in an excited learning phase right now. Um, and I, I, I really want to conquer that before I decide that. I need to just go sail a boat or something like that and do something different or fly a plane. I've always wanted to learn to fly a plane. <laughs> so, how, so how many people do you have on your team right now? So in uh, North America, no, USA, US and Canada, we have with myself included nine. And um, then in the Philippines, I think we have 22. And the, I'll, I'll tell you so right then, now, Philippines is amazing. Sorry. Best staff on earth, best attitude, education, knowledge, just phenomenal if you can start to build a team in the Philippines. Mm. Yeah, most of my team is from the Philippines. Nice. And they're they're developers and testers. Yeah. Um, and my CTO as well is from the Philippines. So what has been your biggest fear? Uh, fear. <sighs> Imposter syndrome peaks in all the time, right? And if you don't know what that is, you're not an entrepreneur, right? You, you, you've got to be questioning yourself every day. Like, am I, is this real? Am I okay to do this? Or should I be doing this? If that thoughts are going through your mind, you don't, I don't think you have that fire to build something. Um, that fear that kind of chimes in me all the time is, is this going to last? Is it going to break down tomorrow? What happens if X breaks or the staff member leaves? Those kind of fears run through my mind. And with that, you, you've got to listen to your fears because they're legitimate and then learn how to build systems, procedures, staff, teams, processes, other verticals for the business to bring in more revenue around those fears. You worry about this person leaving, build a team around that person. If they do leave, you have a replacement because the entire team's there, right? If you're worried about this revenue source failing, okay, is that revenue source truly where your profit's coming from? Bet you it's not sometimes. And uh, is that revenue source replicatable in a different niche? Can you just sell turmeric as joint relief and turmeric as, I don't know, pain relief in two different markets. Can you just spin it like that? Um, can you, it, there's lots of different ways to take what you're already doing and, and replicate it. So I'm always trying to, I guess, use those fears to try and create something new that will mitigate those fears. So I can move on to the next one, I guess. <laughs> Fair enough. At what point did you decide, because you, you said that imposter system is, is, is important, is um, active in your mind. Very prevalent. What made you think that you were ready to coach people on how to do what you do, even though you were probably dealing with your own imposter syndrome probably throughout the, at least the beginning of it and maybe still. Yeah. So the direct marketing world, people, they, they come and they go because making an offer that's successful is, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it doesn't require a lot of skill set. You just need a video guy, you need a web page guy and a great copywriter. And then from there, you can really make something that works so well when you put it on a platform like ClickBank or BuyGoods. These platforms have affiliates that are lined up ready to promote offers all day long. And if you get in front of one or two important ones, it just goes. I, I have a coaching client that does $80 million a year, right? It's crazy huge. Um, the 
sorry, I'm trying to blink now. Ask the question again. <laughs> I drifted too far. <laughs> the imposter syndrome. That's right? okay. Yeah, basically, at what point in your journey did you decide you were ready to be a coach? Yes, the coaching and part. And how how was that? Despite going through imposter syndrome and probably experiencing imposter syndrome when you had the thought of I want to be a coach, but wait, am I ready? Especially because now you're just talking about a guy who's doing five five times more than you, or something four or five times more than you, which is another question I want to ask with uh, as well. Um, yeah, but we can go into that so after the, the imposter system, the imposter syndrome. It happened last night. It happens all the time. Um, so basically, people churn and burn the space. What I'm trying to say, and I I've been around since 2016 when I started this. Hey, just give me 10 seconds of your time. I really appreciate you listening to the episode so far, and I hope you're loving it. And if you are, I would love to ask you to subscribe to the channel because what we do is a lot of work. And every week we bring you a new guest and a new story. And what we do requires so much love so that we can bring you something amazing. And every week we're trying really hard to get better guests that have better stories and improve our ability to tell their stories. So your subscription lets the algorithm know that what we're doing is fantastic and no commitment it's free to do and if you don't like what we're doing later on you can always unsubscribe and either way we would love a like if you don't feel like subscribing at this time thank you very much and we'll take you back to the show now and i wanted people to not make these mistakes i had a really close friend who went from being copywriter to business owner i tried to mentor him and i then watched him continue to make the same mistakes that i was trying to tell him not to do and at that point, another friend who was a coaching business for, for writers basically had mentioned to me when we were golfing, hey, you should do a coaching business on how to do an operations because you do a pretty good job at it. Um, at that point, I pretty much know nothing compared to what I know now, but I was like, you're right. And so I started formulating over months uh, a, a course that has interviews and I teach people um, you know, all the different aspects of the entire direct marketing, affiliate marketing world. And I go through all the different steps with about 50 interviews of all the people and companies who have, who have succeed, helped me succeed, you know, the right customer service, the right credit card process, the right CRM, uh, the right designer, the right copywriters, helping people find the right people the first time. Because if you type in, I need a copywriter, <laughs> there is so many options and 99% uh, of them are worthless. So I, I wanted to help solve that problem and plug it. And then what happened was I actually realized people consumed the videos and didn't do anything. So I turned it into an actual coaching program. And we now have my entire staff coaching and teaching um, operations, sales, uh, marketing, and copywriting on, on weekly um, group calls. And uh, we teach those things. And then, of course, we record it all and put it into our, our digital catalog. And we probably have 100 plus you know, hours of content right now teaching people basically from whether you have a million dollar company and how to build a team like I have, or if you're starting out, how to actually structure your funnel, your company and what to look for and how not to chase shiny objects until you've succeeded certain amounts. And so it was just, you know, you're, you're the smartest guy in the room if you know the most. Am I the best in this, this space? No. But uh, am, I, um, am I one of the better ones that survived through this, all these ups and downs and kept going? Yes. Um, do I want to continue to be better? Yes. And do I think the coaching helps me? immensely i think it does because if i can say see someone doing something and say you need to do that more i can always look at myself and go am i doing that as much as i want him to do it and a lot of times the answer is no and i get to go work on the business some more that's one of the reasons why i do the podcast is because i get to talk to cool people like you and inevitably learn something that helps me make better decisions as a leader so i'm curious how you got this client who's doing nearly nine figures a year. How did you convince him that you can help him or she? I don't know if it's a guy or a girl. I said, I pr you probably don't need my help. So I said, and they said, no, let's work something out. Um, I, it comes down to, you know, the loneliest job in the world as an entrepreneur, that concept, right? You have no one to share and communicate and bounce ideas off of. And I think that's why they we enjoy working together and why they enjoy um, our, our monthly calls to go over ideas and concepts and, and, uh, just to see what's working in a different space. So for them, it's similar to what I do with the coaching and what you do with the podcast. It's a way to uh, understand what's going on and see how similar businesses are functioning and, and work with them. Um, so yeah, it's just uh, not, not being alone and trying to gather as much information as you can. It's probably why they, they wanted to jump on board. And, you know, in, in the direct marketing space, there's probably a dozen guys like them and the rest are all in the, you know, multi seven figure space. There's very few eight figure guys out there. It's really easy to make one to $6 million in revenue. It's hard to get to that next level in the direct marketing world. Um, and so very few have uh, achieved that.
Mm. Yeah. I, random side note. I met a guy who does drop shipping and a lot of people I met that do drop shipping. They're like, they were in Chiang Mai and they're like, yeah, I'm making $2,000 a month and life is good. But I, this guy came to me asking for help with a connection for something. And I was like, how much are you doing like a year? He's like, I do 5 million a month. <laughs> Beautiful. I was like, okay, how do you do 5 million a month? He's like, well, I spend one and a half million on ads. That's a great return. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, man. I'm like, that would probably make it hard for me to sleep at night to like spend that much money a month on ads. A lot of the ad guys in the affiliate space basically have told me it's it's gambling and it's an addiction and they don't want to do it anymore, <laughs> but they can't stop. <laughs> right. I was like trying to think of ways to help him diversify. And he's like, the money is so good. I just don't I don't know what to do. He's like, I don't feel anything making this money anymore, but like, I just don't know where else to go. It's called build a savings account. Understand what your exit is and why. That's the thing, too. My coach did kind of go over is like, what do I want? What is Cody's end goal? Like I said, that, that having that amount of money come to me monthly without having any business existing is, is the, the goal. Build an estate that works. I've been talking for many years about passive income and how passive income is a great way to, to do things well. And the reality is I have struggled to, to create passive income streams for myself. And I think one of the reasons is because the way that I, I have seen it is like the easiest route is real estate, but it's not really easy because you have to find the right property at the right time in the right country with the right interest rate that has the potential to have people paying you all the time. And, you know, you need to have the cash to put a down payment and, you know, you're only limited by how much cash you have to put down payments on it. It's, it's it's like, it sounds easy, but actually like it doesn't generate that much in revenue unless you do it at scale. And right. It's like, it could take you years to build up that scale. So it's like, how much time are you willing to put into that? You know, cause I, there was this like 25 year old guy I heard of, he started out with like a loan from his parents and two years later, he had like a thousand units doing millions of dollars a year in, in revenue from rent. But like, not everyone has that mindset, I think. I would say there's a few little bits of that story missing to actually tell that guy's full story. You know, just being able to buy something and go is there's a, he had an in, he had a connection, he had a uncle that did X, Y, and Z. There was something that allowed for uh, ability to scale. Because everyone, everyone's a connection. I mean, this is a terrible thing to say, and I hate the fact that I say it. I'm 6'2 and blonde. People look at me differently. It, it's stupid. The world should not function this way, but it does. And that's been an upside for me because I've gotten jobs and interviews and things like that because I'm 6'2 and blonde and they wanted to talk to me again. Nothing special. So um, everyone has a little piece that's successful for them, whether it be a family member, a friend, an opportunity, a loan from a parents kind of thing. There's, there's something that everyone has an opportunity. It's a matter of understanding what it is. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was in China for years and I used that being a white guy opportunity, being blonde helped a lot and speaking Chinese was like the thing that did it for most people. Um, Your novelty. They're like, wow, amazing. So I amazing. definitely took advantage. <laughs> yeah, there's like, I could count on my hand the number of white guys in China that could speak Chinese at a business level. There's like not many. Um, so yeah, I took advantage of that. So I'm jealous of that. Launched. When I was in community college, I went to China with my best friend for a month because he's uh, first generation in the United States. We visited all his family, mm -hmm. and I was like, I want to learn Chinese and do business in China. And my parents were like, we're not going to pay for you to go, you know, continue going to college. You get your four years, and that's it. And I was like, ah, oh, bummer. I would have loved to lo do international studies and understand that in the business world. That would have been fun. Well, I I did my four years in America. I got a degree in psychology, and then I, I took myself to China. Nice. Yeah, and I learned Chinese while I was an English teacher in the day and then learning Chinese when I wasn't working. And then after a few years, I got into business once I could speak Chinese. Oh, amazing. Yeah. I've talked about it with other people on other podcasts, but yeah, it, it it's uh, been an incredible life so far, for sure. Um, so how do you celebrate wins? That's something I've been having to teach myself, right? 
you know, it was always like, you know, worry about the losses, worry about the failures, but oops, I didn't realize I just did a million dollars in sales last month. Right. Um, for me, it's becoming, I'm trying to celebrate when I create the ability for me not to have to work. So I just did a road trip. I have a little, our little 23 foot RV and my wife and I just did a three and a half week cross country road trip. Got to see all the sites, national parks, camp in great places, meet interesting people. It was really fun. And, you know, being able to set myself up for that, where I don't have to do anything, respond to an email, look at my calendar, care about anything, look at a report, just know that it's done. You know, that's my celebration because I'm able to free myself of the business for real. Yeah, you know, As an owner or a high C-level uh, employee, you tend to just live your job. And so for me, it's been kind of learning how not to live my career because it's just a thing that may not last long. You may leave it. And then what are you if you don't have something else? So it's kind of rediscovering everything I used to have when I was younger and poor and broke and I guess happier <laughs> because I was, uh, you know, I'm having to understand what those hobbies are and enjoyments are in life. For now, it's definitely RV and I think it's fun. I remember before I got involved in business, I, I would work a job, I would save some money, and then I would go backpack around Asia for a month and I didn't have to work. And it was amazing. And I can definitely understand how there's a benefit in, in unplugging and not wanting to do that. I, I'm curious if at the end of that trip, you were kind of like, do I have to go back to work? Like, they're fine. I'm, I'm sure they don't need me anymore. Yeah, the, it definitely it's two sides. So it was the it was the I, I care about my clients for the coaching program. So I really wanted to get in there and see where they were and then kick some in the back of the butt and be like, get to work. You said you'd have this done. You know, I want to be that like, you know, coach to really smack people in shape. In, in terms of my team, you know, I, I, I didn't have no worries. I literally was nervous to come back in feeling like I'm going to get in the way. Like, should I even be here kind of thing? Like, that's the kind of the, the, the imposter syndrome happening again, right? Um, but that's kind of what's been going, going through my mind after coming back for sure. And I think it's just, again, repositioning my thought process, right? I am not in the operations, the sales, the dev design. I'm the CEO. I'm in charge of the vision of the company. And I'm in charge of making sure the company has the funds to keep growing. That's it. And I'm there to help my help me to help my COO, my CFO, and, uh, uh, answer questions and, and take care of what they need to do. But that's what I'm supposed to do. And and a company needs that. You know, just as every country needs a president or you know prime minister, we all need kind of a, a figurehead at top to just kind of go. This is the direction we're going for the next year, and we'll course correct as needed. Every 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 organization needs it, mm -hmm. and I have it's just learning how to be that. It's tough. It's a uh, much different than the entrepreneurial world where you're just like, I'll do everything and never sleep and drink coffee 24 seven. It's, um, it's a different mindset, which is, I think, a good lesson to kind of learn in life too. Yeah, it's, it's something that like, there's no handbook for being a CEO because every CEO has their own strengths and they have to learn to play to that. And it's, when I first realized that my team basically didn't need me, like I felt like, what the hell am I doing every day? I felt lost because I was like, I, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't feel like there's anything that I can do on an individual daily basis that I can contribute back to my company. Like, what the hell am I doing? Maybe I should go start another company. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, being a CEO is difficult, but I, I, I agree completely that, uh, those are two of maybe three or four things that are like extremely important. You, I, I sometimes I'll do one on ones with my team because uh, there's twelve of us, and um, the last time I did that, well, I, I did one on ones with them this past week, but I did it like uh, back in at the end of April, and I said to them, you know, do you know what it is my job? Like, do you know what I'm what my responsibility is as a CEO? Because like I I know what what your responsibilities are, but like, do you know what mine are? And they're like, no, not really. And I was like, well, I see myself as having four responsibilities. One is setting the vision. Two is making sure there's the best people that could possibly be doing those jobs. The third is making sure that you understand what that vision is. And the fourth is making sure that you have the money to be able to do what you need to do and that you can be fed. If at any point you feel like I'm missing any of those things, please, you need to tell me. 
because I may not see it. Everyone, and if I don't see it, everyone, everyone else probably knows it. Everyone listening needs to write those four things down and just stick it on the wall. Like that, that is so truthful right there. And if you're a company owner, that is where you're going to go. So in my coaching program, when I have the one-on-one -on -one clients, the first assignment we give them is to make an org chart because most people don't have one. Or if they do, it's old and archaic and broken and kind of just has one spot for each person. And if you ever read the E-Myth, you have to understand that at the beginning, you know, people wear 10 different positions and 10 different hats at once. And you have to build that org chart of where you actually are and where you actually want to go and have, start creating that decision of where people are in the company. Like you said, it's huge. It's incredibly important. Um, but yeah, those four things you said are phenomenal. Like that's the direction you have to start from when you start your company as an entrepreneur doing everything yourself. That is your goal. That is where you have to achieve yourself to be. And you have to find everyone else to take care of all the other tasks. And if you're not that person, like the owner, owner of Craigslist, right? He's not a CEO. He just works as like an engineer in the company or did until he retired. Um, like, if that's the case, cool. But um, otherwise, you're going to be in charge and setting the setting the pace for the company. Yeah, one thing, another thing that I, I learned that was quite interesting is, like, we all have our own strengths. So, for example, uh, I know CEOs whose strength is tech, and so they're a technical founder. Where they might really be doing the job of like a CTO, but with the CEO's hat until later on, where they have to make that distinction of like, am I the CEO or the CTO? Um, there's someone that might be finance focused and they might be doing the job of the CFO until they have to decide, am I going to be the CFO or the CEO? Um, or am I going to do both? Um, which could be dangerous for the company as a whole to have them re rely on, on one person for both. Um, and so I recently had a conversation with my COO where he's like, look, to be fair, there's some things that you do that I think I'm supposed to be doing. And there's things that I do that probably you should be doing. So I think like we really need to figure out what the hell it is that like we're going to be doing in the future so that everyone else knows where they fall in the accountability chart from there. Because, you know, like right now you're working on product stuff and so you've got this product manager, but as the COO, I also need to be involved in products so that I can make sure that the, the marketing team knows what's going on. So like they don't really know who they're supposed to be talking to at times because, well, are they supposed to talk to me about this? Are they supposed to talk to you about this? And it's not really like clear. And so it's also really, really important to make sure that not just have an organization chart, but also make sure that everyone knows who the hell it is that they're supposed to be dealing with. Um, because there were times where it's possible some of the developers thought that they were reporting to the the product manager, but like, no, they report to the CTO and the lead developer, you know, but like they work alongside of the product manager who helps feed them with, you know, what's going on from the product and the project side. So um, I think these things operationally could can cause a big mess and they have for us for sure. It, it's that's the, the idea of growing pains. If you again, if you if you or any of the listeners haven't read the the, the book, The E-Myth, it kind of talks about having setting that stage and setting that expectation of who people are and the roles and everything on those lines, because if you don't have it figured out, then you're going to have butt heads. Um, you're going to want to have this initial feeling of just, you know, destroying it and taking it back to the way it was. And it never will be the way it was because it was growing. A growing company is not the same as a dying company. Um, and having that idea of, of where everyone belongs on the tree is, is key. It doesn't have anything to do with salaries or bonuses or anything else. It's just how information and expectations move up because if the company has a goal of a million dollars, how does each department Ref, uh, reflect that goal of achieving a million dollars, sales, operations, customer service, whatever, whatever it may be, uh, technical uh, teams, everyone should align back to that. And it's, it's crucial for an entity and a business to survive, thrive and grow. And if you're a CEO and boss like me, you want to share the wealth and the, the success with your team when it does um, succeed. And that's the goal because I want to do well for myself and do well for all my staff. What's something you know you need to change, but you've avoided doing? Hmm. For me, it's letting go of more things. Just yesterday in our coaching program, I handed over the keys to my calendar for the first time in my life to somebody and said, you're in charge of scheduling the coaching clients and sales calls and things like that. And I taught her how I like to run my schedule and she can see everything from my, you know, the dentist appointment on there to <laughs> picking up my dogs from the groomer. Like she can see it all. Right. Um, which is something I've never really shared with people before. And, uh, so that was something good. Then like the next step is going to be a similar one with email is learning to let go of email and having, uh, my executive assistant actually 
take charge of it and sort through, organize, and, you know, basically uh, deliver me summaries every day versus me having to go through and comb through, you know, a hundred emails, organizing them all correctly and cleaning them up and replying to the ones that need to and sorting out the ones that, that don't. So that's the thing I'm probably afraid of most is that, that control and giving that trust to someone else. But it's like everything in the business, you know, it was a financial leap. It was a, uh, everything was a leap so far. So this is another leap in my um, emotional, you know, mental state that I have to make to be able to keep growing the business. So I can in turn focus on, like you said earlier, those four points, you need to make a poster of those four points or a t-shirt. That's phenomenal. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You heard it here first. We live to build twenty nine ninety nine shirt. There you go. <laughs> Just got to go on uh what's it called? One of these t-shirt T Vista, or I don't know what they're called, but yeah. What is the single most important change you've had to make in yourself over the last few years or throughout your career? Same thing. It's learning to let go and empower others. Okay. So yeah, it's as an entrepreneur, you just want to do everything, control everything, have your hands and everything and control all the strings and be the puppet master. It's not possible. We're humans. We are very not capable of doing a million tasks at once. We're not computers. Yeah, we don't have the AI capability. So, yeah. Let I think go. I'm different. Sorry, I think I'm different from a lot of people where I don't want to do any of that stuff. Well, I, I never want to wanted e to do any. Of I don't it. want to either, but I'm afraid to let someone else do it. <laughs> I don't think I'm afraid to let other people do it. I just never wanted to do it and just felt like I had no choice because I didn't have the people to do it. Yeah, I, I could see that in there as well. It, it's It's been an interesting journey. My team now is phenomenal. Um, you know, earlier you said, make sure they're in the right seats. You know, we've, we've moved some people around different seats. We've promoted some people. We've changed people to different departments and different roles from leadership to not leadership. But when you find the right, if you have a good person, it's your job just to find the right seat. And when you do, then all of a sudden things just become smooth. You can let go. You can trust that it's going to get done. You know, there's the right person taking care of the job. It's a good feeling. Would you say it's more important to hire like an operations manager first or like a doer, someone who like takes a task off your hand that that's like struggling? So if, let's say, for example, for me, let's say I'm doing video editing. Let's say I'm doing five hours a week of or 10 hours a week of video editing, like what do you think is more valuable getting rid of that video editing or, or creating a position for someone to like make sure that they can find someone else to the video ed editing and then also handle all the other things that you're doing well i'll, introduce you, I'll first introduce you to piotor who's our video editor who's amazing and i'll, I'll, I'll cook you up with that so you can reduce your five hours that way um in so the question is kind of do you find someone to do it yourself or do you build a position that find that finds that and builds it for you is that what kind of you're kind of asking right basically Looking back on your experience, do you think it's smarter to build from the bottom up or to build from the top down? You instinctively want to build from the bottom up because you don't want to spend money because you think it's all yours, even though it's the company's money and you're robbing it because you shouldn't be paying yourself what you're being paid because your company's not doing as well as you think it is. So right. top first, you find you, you I, if I could start again tomorrow, um, I'm a salesperson, right? I'm much more of a sales guy than an operations guy. Like I said, I did great with the chocolate, the magazine sales, all stuff like that. I, I, was, I was a sales rep for US food service. I was the third best in San Diego. Like I was, a, I'm a sales guy. So I would as start out by hiring a COO, a high operations person who understands how to build teams and how to set up systems and how to build uh, organizational structures. And then I would have done the sales until we brought enough revenue in to then hire a salesperson. Um, I probably would have hired a CFO or um, a, a high level accountant um, style person, maybe before the salesperson. But um, those are the three things you need to have. You need an operations person, you need a money person, and you need a, uh, a salesperson. If you have those three things, then you can truly be a CEO and the team will start being built underneath you. Um, because a CFO will say, no, you need to put, not take that money out and you put it into the business. The operations person will say, I need to hire three more people. And then the salesperson will go out and hustle to ensure that you guys have the, the cash to be able to do so. So I guess let's take that from another angle because you're building this coaching business. And I don't know how much overlap there is between the two. Um, I think you said some of your employees from the um, uh e-commerce side or doing coaching? Yeah, my 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 op, my COO coaches, my um, VP of sales coaches, our, our marketing director coaches, uh, everyone who is a leader in the company, I want them coaching because people are looking to build similar teams and understand it. 
And I, I wish to God I had this kind of opportunity when I started because it would have been amazing to know the direction I should be shooting for as opposed to trying to just invent it and not know how to build the team and the structure and who should be in charge and what their expectations should be and how they should make reports. I had none of that. I just had to kind of cross my fingers and hope. So yeah, they, they all, they all help with that. Um, they all teach on the other side. And, um, so everything in the company is kind of crossed. So we're, we're, we're an umbrella. So we have a company called Waddle Bear Media. It's named after my little tiny, uh, spaniel that passed away recently, but she waddled around her skin kind of waddled. And so we called it the Waddle Bear Media because it was silly. And that's kind of the house umbrella for both the brands, our different sales channels and the different services, which be the coaching and the digital, um, design and dev and data and things like that. So hiring top down is better if you could start all over from the point of view of building an e-commerce brand but now you're a coach what would you say if you were telling another coach how they should build their coaching business should it still be top down even if they may not drive the revenue from a top-down point of view. Yeah, it's it's still that concept of having the, the leadership team first, right? You don't hire the video editor, you contract out the video ed- video stuff, right? But in terms of building that actual in-house team where they're dedicated full-time to you, it's top-down. So we look at it as there's a visionary and an integrator, right? CEO, COO. Um, and if you, everyone's gonna lean towards one side. Again, I said I was sales, so I'm more towards that visionary, that creative side, I'm less towards operations. So I, I know that I would be the salesy, salesy person with the direction of the company, and I need someone to cover the operations side. If you're more of an introverted person and you're more in the systems and stuff like that, you might be more in the operations, and then you'd hire the salesperson first. So it's kind of choosing which one you are and which one you need. And then I think immediately after that, it's an accountant CFO person to make sure that you have your numbers right, because I suffered the numbers for years until we finally figured it out. <laughs> so you want to have someone who understands numbers can tell you what you, how well you're doing is so important. Okay. So what are you currently learning right now? Well, so right now it's actually more about the, fi- the money of the business. So my biggest struggle right now is learning how to think like a CFO would so I can better communicate with my CFO. Because right now I get a lot of um, CFO jargon and I'm like, huh, what? And I'm having to understand what that means and learn how to read these reports. Um, because I'm the, I have a tendency to want to build things uniquely. Like I built an entire spreadsheet dashboard for um, some of our finances. And I come to find out it's basically a, the, uh, the books, it's basically the balance stuff, just, just displayed slightly differently. So instead of trying to come up with this cockamamie way to, to show something, I should have just learned how to read it the other way. You know, instead of inventing a new language, I should have just learned the language that exists. So that's definitely my struggle right now is, is understanding fin- the finance of the business at a really high level and learning how to budget forecast and then um, aggressively change that as the months happen. So, you know, are, are we have a rolling 12 month forecast that's um, constantly updating based on how, what we're doing. That definitely sounds very valuable. I've learned with my COO that I can build whatever I want. He's just going to go, yeah, this is crap. Let me fix it. He's gonna <laughs> actually, like do it right. And I've been very fortunate. I've been able to lean on him for like projections, financial projections and things like that. But uh, I definitely need to get involved in the finances a bit more as well, because I've I've watched guys like Alex Hermosi and they're like, you need to know your numbers. You need to know your numbers. Like if, if you want, like, for example, take it from the point of view of the coaching side, like, all right, if you want to do $2.5 million this year, you need to know that like, you're going to charge 5,000 per client. You assume that you need to get nine new clients a month in order to hit that. So how many salespeople do you like the guy just freaking rattles off like all these incredible uh, numbers based on like, it seems to be very simple multiplication, division, subtraction, like fractions, all that. Like, okay, you know, you, you want to close nine people and you've got a 10% close rate. So you need to get 90 people in through leads. So, you know, uh, if you're going through paid ads, how much do you have to spend in ads? You know, what's your CPM? So, okay, you figure you have to spend $500 a month to get those 90 leads. So that's this, you know, five cents per lead or whatever. Um, obviously those numbers are wrong, but yeah, like I, when I started listening to the way this guy talks, I'm like, I don't know anything about numbers. So yeah, it's I'm crucial. Like... And, and it's, it's tough too, though, when you, when you want to start understanding if you have multiple divisions in the company, which one's making more money or not, which one's sucking at more cash, which one's not, um, and, and how to properly um, control that, uh, determine 
where the budget should be applied to, who's what part of the company's costing, um, utilizing the team of customer service and which one's not and how you apply it all and then who, how you're compensating people. Because if you have a sales team and let's say the front end of the business is a loss, loss leader, the sales team can't see zero dollars. They'll be depressed every day. A salesperson needs to see growth. They need to see sales dollars. So you have to engineer it in a way right. that your back end money pays back in. So the sales rep then is excited because they have a, a, a positive number they're attributing to to increase their paycheck and also grow the business. So there's a lot of understanding how it all works together and then how to how it all applies to the psychology of the team members and who's in charge of what and what they see and how that affects them too. So numbers are a stressful, annoying, exciting, and uh it's my new thing for Q3, Q4 to try and dial in. So by next year, I'll be solid. The team will be solid. And I think it'll be good. What's the most important thing you've learned in your life? Not to give up. And, and also to know that if you're evolving is not giving up. Going from my gym to a supplement business wasn't giving up on the gym. It was just evolving my concept of how I'm helping people find health. Right. Um, going from going from a supplement business selling, selling to helping people um, um create their own brand is not giving up on, on selling supplements and nutrition. It's empowering other people to affect and reach more. Cause if I can only affect 2000 people, 3000 people a month, if I can get 10 people to do the same thing, I'm suddenly affecting 30,000 people. So it's understanding that your career is an evolution and just not giving up to it. Uh, and understanding there is a, a connecting point and kind of showing that, you know, growth that you get going, but just not giving up those, those who go, Oh, I did it. And it was tough. So I quit figure out a way to do it that doesn't cost you as much. Figure out a way to do it while you pay back your credit cards. There's a way to do it. You just got to keep exploring. We all have access to the entire world on Google. So there's bazillions of articles and videos and coaching and ideas and resources. You can find a way. Would you say that's the most important advice that you would have? Or is there anything else? No, that's it. That is that is just staying focused, stay, staying focused, staying on course. I mean, I guess on a side note, don't chase shiny objects. Just because you figured out how to sell things online doesn't mean you should pivot to a whole different niche. Get really good at what you do. Get to the point where you don't have to work. Your team does it for you before you decide to pivot. Great. All right. Thank you, Cody. I appreciate it. My pleasure.